Gracious Lord, we ask that you would teach us more of your truth, that you would help us to know, receive, and share more of your love in the world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. About five years ago, there was a study done um, that came back, and it was looking at what stresses people out. And it came back, and it said that 72% of people are stressed out about finances at some level. And it came back and said 22% of people are extremely stressed out about finances. About the same time, about a year in front of that, um, one of the big national banks had done some survey work, and they came back and said when people take up various topics, the number one topic that people find the hardest to speak about is finances. It was 44% of people said that was the most difficult topic. The second one was death at 38%, and then I think religion and politics were further down the list. So we arrived today at another one of these topics that's one that impacts almost everybody, but it's also difficult to talk about. And on top of that, we're not only doing that, but we're, we're trying to figure out how we help a friend that's going through this. So it's a very difficult and complicated topic, and I'm going to ask for lots of grace on today's sermon um, about different things that, that might be said or not said in this. Um, but what we want to do today, we're doing this, um, we're going to take up this whole topic as the final sermon in a series that we've been doing that's entitled Helping a Friend in Hard Times. And all of these sermons are up online if you want to go see them. But we started talking about how everything is based on the hope, the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We started that on Easter. And then we talked about depression in dark places. We talked about divorce. And today we're going to talk about money issues. And where I'd like to go today is I would like to... Um, give a bit of a meditation about Christians and money, because it's going to affect everything we talk about after that. And then for the second part, I I want to explicitly talk about what are some ideas about what you might say to a friend that's going through such a hard time. And before we get sort of to any of that, or something that applies to, to everything we're going to talk about, is I want to start by talking about the place of humility. And um, here I want to begin by saying a thank you to you for all of those who wrote in this past week um, when I asked for input, who took time to write. I know some of you are really, really busy, stayed up late. I got several multi-page emails and letters um, about this topic. But one person who wrote in, who one of the people who wrote in with a really long um, response, ended it by saying, the bottom line is, be kind and be humble as you try to help others. And I want to dwell on that be humble for a minute because inevitably when we talk about money, and particularly when we're talking about helping somebody, we're really talking about a power dynamic where money can be power and somebody has more of it than someone else and all these kinds of things. And so I think we've got to lean into this Christian principle about humility. And when we think about it in this context, to me, I think we start by going back to uh, um, the first chapter of James, the 17th verse that talks about how every good gift that we have is from the Father of lights. And to me, what what we should be mindful about in that is whatever intelligence you have, whatever opportunities you've had, whatever Skinner box or circumstances you had that raised you, to have a work ethic or to be able to make money and all of these different kinds of things, it's a gift. It's a gift. Or as Bono says, sometimes even the accident of latitude and longitude about where you were born and the opportunities that you have that way, all of it. And some people just straight out have the gift of making money, but it's a gift. It's a gift from God. There's an old saying in the church, you'll still hear it sometimes, where people will will say at the time of the offertory, they'll say, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you, um, is the response that comes back. It's a reminder that everything we have, every gift, every intelligence, all charisma, everything, it's all a gift from God. And so when we approach this topic, to me, what it means is if you're in a place where you have things and you're able to help somebody, you got to know you're not better than them. 
And if you're in a place, in a chapter of life where you need help, you're not worse than the person helping you. That's part of recognizing this aspect of the gift and the humility. And ultimately, we come back to looking at the example and the model of Jesus. And this week, I noticed something I've never noticed before. I think probably the most famous passage in the Bible about Jesus' humility is in 2 Philippians. And it's, it's this passage that has its own name, the kenosis. And um, before I read it, I've never really noticed the verse that goes right before it. Because Paul's talking to the Philippians, and he tells them, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. So he's giving them this admonition to look after other people. And then he follows it immediately with this famous passage. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself, being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus sets the ultimate example of humility to which all Christians are called. And I think as we enter into this discussion today, it has to be front and center. As we do that, I want to say a few words um, about just some thoughts about Christians and money. And I should say up front that I don't think these are things you're necessarily going to say to a friend that's in need, because as I'll say in a few minutes, giving advice is kind of a bit rough. But I think the more we take these things on board, the more we're going to be in a place to minister, even if we don't say these things directly. And so I, and these, this is not exhaustive, but I just want to say a few things about Christians and money. The first of which, maybe the most important thing, we don't see money as the end game. Money is not what life is about. Um, the passage that Eric read a minute ago reminds us that in like a bunch of different ways. One of the ways is talking about how Jesus is saying, don't make your focus storing up treasure on earth where moth and rust and thieves and different stuff can get to it, but make your focus trying to store up treasures in heaven. Make your aim, your goals, your vision, uh, how you're living your life being this other place. And there are lots of different things outside of the Bible that back this up. They've done studies that show money doesn't lead to happiness. It, like a certain level, it helps you, but after that, it just tanks. It does, it's not the ultimate. I saw a quote the other day from Jim Carrey, the comedic um, actor, who said this. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. And... Um, Chuck Colson of the Watergate sort of infamy, who later became a great Christian, um, talks a little bit about this. He was in Naples, and he talks about all the executives from around the world who come to retire in Naples, 27 golf courses and all the different things that take place there. And he, he was given the opportunity, I think pretty regularly, to speak in a number of formats to some of these people. And um, what he said in that, I'm going to read a quote from him. He says, he's talking to these executives. He says, do you really want to live your life counting up the number of times you chase that little white ball around these, those greens? And they kind of chuckle, but it's a nervous chuckle because in six months they've realized how banal their lives are. And they've got beautiful homes, castles, and when they get bored with that, they build a bigger castle and they're miserable. The object of life is not what we think it is which is to achieve power, money, pleasure. That's not the Holy Grail. The object of life is the maturing of the soul. And you reflect that maturing of the soul when you care more for other people than yourself. There's an idea that Christians are going to lean right into that and say it's not about us. And we start looking at all these different principles about money. We are not able to read the words of Jesus without getting that we as Christians have to care about the poor. We have to care about the marginalized. That's part of what it means to, live in, to lean into the Christian mission. And, you know, the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, says a lot about money. One of the uh, Anglican priests I worked, worked at with in London, Sandy Miller, who's now a bishop, he used to say this. He's, he would say, you go read the Bible. It has a lot to say about money. Money's not bad, but it's dangerous. It will take a hold of you and rob you of your spiritual life. 
It'll take you to these other places. And Jesus says something about that, and I'll go there in a minute. But the Bible says lots about how we live with money. We chose a number of passages today from Proverbs that we read a minute ago that remind us about how Scripture says to care for the poor, about how Scripture tells us to be wise with it, about how Scripture wants us to be industrious and to not be, have debt and all this. And there are lots of gurus out there who want to give us lots of techniques from the Bible. I don't really know that these guys really have um, biblical basis for all the stuff they say, but I think they've helped a lot of people. You're not able to drive around Dallas. In fact, last night I came down I-30 and I saw a big billboard with Dave Ramsey. And Dave Ramsey's on one of the radio stations, but he would be one of these people who's an evangelical who will tell you he thinks he's got principles from the Bible about how to do this. All I know is he's helped a lot of people. When you go look at what he says, the first things he, he tells everybody is get you an emergency fund so that you've got something to fall back on. Get rid of debt, starting with the easiest one first, and then get some savings. You know, those are, but those are, that's common sense. Maybe he's got scripture to back that, but he's helped a lot of people. And there's lots of different things. If you go read all these things on scripture, it has a lot of things to say about. But the most important of which I think is the one we read today in the gospel. Jesus wants us to know you cannot have two masters. It's either going to be him or it's going to be money. And we get into the wrong place, the bad place. If we think we're going to make money our master and faith is going to become our hobby, it doesn't work. He's to be the center place. He wants us to be, it wants to be front and center. And it, it changes how we feel about anxiety around money. That's what Jesus said today. Don't be anxious about all this stuff. Seek the kingdom first. And all this other stuff will fall into place. One of my spiritual heroes is Henry Nouwen, the spiritual writer. And um, Henry Nouwen, in one of his books, in the book Here and Now, he tells about the first time that he met Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And uh, I want to read part of what he says when he met her, uh, because I think it's powerful as we think about anxiety and things that come up. He says, I was struggling with many things at the time and decided to use the occasion to ask Mother Teresa's advice. As soon as we sat down, I started explaining all my problems and difficulties, trying to convince her of how complicated it all was. When after 10 minutes of elaborate explanation, I finally became silent, Mother Teresa looked at me quietly and said, well, when you spend one hour a day adoring your Lord and never doing anything which you know is wrong, you'll be fine. Jesus says, strive first for the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. It's a daily endeavor for us um, to do that. The final thing I want to say before we switch gears is what uh, maybe you expect a clergyman to say, but it's the importance of giving. Because I think part of giving, even if we had all the money, even if there was no poverty in the world, even if there were no great needs in the world, Giving would still be an important piece of our spiritual life because it's about us letting go. It's about not holding things tightly. It's about, it's about this spiritual practice of honoring God by recognizing what we have as a gift from Him and giving back to Him. There's all the, you will not have a healthy spiritual life without giving. It's part of what it is. All right, I want to switch gears now and turn and talk about you've got a friend who is in a, um, a financial straits, has got bad stuff going on, what do you do? And I, again, I want to start by emphasizing again the place of humility. One of the people who wrote in this week said, whatever you do, make sure you treat that person as if they're an equal, as they are an equal. Don't treat them any other way. So be humble, be kind. Another person wrote in and just said, look, be mindful not to judge. You don't know at the end of the day why the person is in that place. It could have been a medical thing. It could have been a divorce. It could have been some expense with kids. It could have been unemployment. It could be a pandemic. And yes, it could be bad decisions. But don't judge. We're meant to be agents of hope. Other people wrote in. I had one person who wrote in who's, who was telling me things not to do. 
And one of the things they said is don't glare at them and don't, don't bring this judgment down on them for whatever is going on in their life. And he talked about how when he was in this place, he was also unemployed, struggling with about to slip into depression. And he said this, because you have so little to be happy, hopeful, or excited about when you're unemployed, it's very tempting to reach for the comfort of an escape or some retail therapy. Have compassion. Don't judge. It's hard when you're in those places. And, and it's easy for us to get the feelings. Other people wrote in today that said the, the feelings they had when they're in that place is a feeling of shame and a feeling that you're a failure. That's the place in which we want to speak hope into. We're to be agents of hope. We talked about this at Easter, that we, we lean into the living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we've said every single week, Eric said it last week, sometimes we have to be the hope. We have to help carry the hope for people. Remind them that God will never give up on them. That God will always walk with them. And sometimes to even step back and be mindful that we are but grass and, and to have this eternal perspective of a bigger picture of what happens, right? The other thing I would say um, as we talk to our friend or work with our friend is to pray. Pray for them. Pray with them. One of the things I've learned over the years is sometimes people feel guilty for some reason praying about their jobs or praying about their business or whatever. But Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, we say every week, we'll say it in a few minutes, asks us to pray for our, our daily bread. That's praying for us to, to make a living. That's praying for employment. So Jesus wants us to do that. We come to him and we pray for that. And we're mindful on um, Good Shepherd Sunday that he, he will tend to us. He'll guide us. He'll care for us. So we want to pray. And it's super dangerous um, as you meet with your friend. Try not to give advice. I mean, you want to help them and give them hope. I love the way one person wrote in on the, and, and talked about this. She said this, if you have a deep need to give advice, couch it in a humble manner. Maybe say, you've probably thought of most good options. However, if you want to brainstorm about some new job ideas or other needs, I'm ready to do so if you think it might be helpful. Humble, loving. If the person is in acute crisis, all the things we've just talked about would still apply, but be mindful there are community resources that are available from food banks to other ministries that sometimes can give money. Um, sometimes if somebody's in a bad enough place, you might offer to get them their groceries. I know one person wrote in who said that is something that really blessed them. The per they commented that not only did the person say, I want to get your groceries this week, but they went to the grocery store and they didn't go follow them looking at what they bought, but they just said, I'll meet you at the, at the cashier when you're done. I know people who've given anonymous gifts to somebody. They know they're on the edge. They gave them the mortgage payment that month. And um, hopefully Chris won't um, fire me for saying this, but one of the funnest experiments I think I've ever done was a year when um, we should all pray and tithe to the church. But there was one year where I felt like I was being led to not give everything to the church. I held back money for that year and said, how can I bless people with this money? How can I, how can I see somebody directly in need and give them some money anonymously. And that passage about how it's more blessed to give than to receive took on new meaning. Like there was, I, it was just such a joy to know you'd help somebody and they didn't know who it was. They would never know who it was. And it was just a gift to get to do that. There are all kinds of ways that you can help people in that way. I had another friend who went through a year and a half of unemployment. And he wrote in to talk about how one of his friends told him, hey, just assume if we go out together, I'm picking up the tab. We're not talking about it. It totally doesn't matter to me. We're not going to keep track, and you won't owe me. Is this idea that it's, it was just a feeling of acceptance and blessing in that, right? And I'll say this um, as we wind things up. You know, this is for acute stuff. Be mindful there are also people who go through crises. We may not be acute, but they're in extreme stress. And remember that people can go through this at any economic level. Because at the end of the day, you can be, make a ton of money, but if you spend a ton of money plus, you're going to be headed towards a crisis, right? And that happens. And one of the things we might do as we talk about planning 
goes back to one biblical principle. When we talk about giving, one of the things Scripture talks about is giving from first fruits. And over the years, I've reflected on that. And part of the reason I think that is, is because if we don't say, I make X amount of money before we start building our budget, say I'm going to give, we can build our budget or just let our budget happen. And we get to the end and we're like, oh, I don't have any money left to give. Because we've made all these decisions we may not see. We made a decision about where we live and what we pay. We made a decision about this club we pay for, all these things. And we get to the end and it's like, sorry, Jesus, I don't have much left. But it, God says, give up front and then build things from there, right? That it's, it's a matter of bringing it up to the front. And it blesses us as we do that and as we learn that. And it's just a planning thing, right? That comes in. I know that's the way it sh- I should just speak for myself. That's the way it's been for me. As we wrap this um, sermon series up, I think there are lots of ways we can help friends in hard times. At the end of the day, the single most important thing, I think, is to remember that we're meant to be agents and ambassadors of God's love, mercy, grace, and hope. And I believe as we pray for our friends and as we go into those places, God's Spirit will lead us and guide us and will give us the words and will help us figure out how to bless others as instruments of God. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you love us. You never leave us. You never give up on us. And whatever we go through, you're with us. And we thank you for friends along the way that help us. And in our own season, we ask that you would help us to be a friend that blesses others. Not of our own steam, but of yours, as you work through us as instruments. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.